All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, it's a joy to be able to share with you. We uh, just want to appreciate the three opening hymns, all by Thomas Kelly, uh, as requested, because uh, we're going to speak about Thomas Kelly this evening. And we have plenty to choose from, over 700 hymns of Thomas Kelly to pick. Uh, but I want to think about him. Before we do, I want to just begin by looking at a scripture in 2 Samuel and chapter 23, and I'm going to read the first two verses. It's a, actually a beautiful scripture because um, it's a it's one of those uh, passages in the Old Testament that reveal the triunity of God, uh, that God in three persons. And so it's an exciting in that way, although that's not our purpose of looking at the moment. But verse 1 and 2 of 2 Samuel 23, it says, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob. So we've got God, the God of Jacob. The sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. Of course, we know that rock which followed them was Christ. So they've got the the Lord Jesus, the eternal son, uh, you do have, of course, God mentioned, and of course, you have the spirit of the Lord spake by me. So really a, a great Trinitarian confession from an Old Testament saint. But for our purposes, I just wanted to point out that David considered himself to be the sweet psalmist of Israel. And uh, I think it wasn't just an idle boast, but he wrote um, a, a lion's share of Israel's hymn book, the book of Psalms. And uh, he wrote many of them and some of them wonderful messianic Psalms. And so uh, we would say that he's the sweet Psalmist of Israel. And we'd, we would agree with him in that sentiment that he was the sweet Psalmist of Israel. However, when we think of uh, our own, uh, especially the old country, we're going to just talk about the old country today. I'm not talking about Israel. I'm talking about uh, Great Britain and Ireland. And I want to think about uh, that that part of the world. And if you would say, well, who is the sweet psalmist of England? Uh, you'd have a real difficulty there because it, it, some would immediately say, well, that's Isaac Watts. And then others will say, no, 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 that's Charles Wesley. And they certainly had some uh, great hymn, hymn writers uh, in England. Wales is a little bit more easy um, because uh, it's kind of commonly held that William Williams of Panticellon was the sweet psalmist of Wales. And uh, he, of course, uh, wrote a hymn we would all be familiar with, Guide us, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrims in this barren land. But when we come to Ireland, without question, the sweet psalmist of Ireland was Thomas Kelly. Just because of the sheer bulk of hymns that he has written that have found their way into hymn books, our Believer's Hymn Book, Hymns of Worship and Remembrance, a Little Flock Hymn Book, uh, quite a, a number of his hymns have found their way into these hymn books. Uh, what about Scotland? Well, that's more difficult because the Scottish kind of clinged on to singing psalms, the Scottish Psalter, for a long, long time. And they resisted uh, any other hymnology, but thankful in the revivals in the 1800s, there was a guy called Horatio Bonar, who also wrote some magnificent hymns and might well be called the sweet psalmist of Scotland. Well, <clears throat> we want to think about Mr. Kelly and about him, his life and times. And I want to just mention that we've already had, we'll sing of the shepherd that died as one of his hymns. Glory, glory, everlasting be to him who bore the cross, another one of his hymns. Um, uh, Behold the lamb with glory crowned, glory to God on high, peace upon earth and joy. We sing the praise of him who died, Savior through the desert leaders. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. Praise the Savior, ye who know him. M many of these, those of us that, uh, remember the Lord each Lord's Day morning. Uh, we know these hymns. We know them well. We, we've sung them many, many times. But what do we know about the author of these hymns? Well, internet's a very interesting place. You can find some amazing things. I actually found a, a sermon preached um, in a Church of Ireland church called St. Mark's Church in Boris and Ossery uh, on Wednesday, the 3rd of August, 2011. And it was 
kind of a little vignette, a life story of Thomas Kelly, which I found very interesting. And so I'm going to, I'm drawing from there, from other places too. Uh, but one of the things that this uh, individual who preached this sermon said was that he was a, a man from County Leash in Ireland, uh, one of Ireland's 32 counties, uh, from a place called Ballintubbert, uh, almost on the, the border between Leash and Kildare, which are kind of in the Midlands of Ireland, right in the center of the country. And what he said was Thomas Kelly was probably unfortunate to live when he did. <laughs> Uh, kind of an interesting statement, unfortunate to live when he did, because I believe that God puts us or brings us to the kingdom for such a time as this. I don't think there's any unfortunate in it, but he felt it was unfortunate. And of course, he's speaking as somebody from the Church of Ireland. And what he's saying really is this. If his ministry had have been in our time, he could have been greatly used in that withering church called the Church of Ireland. And he was kind of wishing that Thomas Kelly lived in his generation rather than living back when he did, because it would he would have had a great impact in the Church of Ireland. And so what, what do we know about him? Well, we, he was a son of a high court judge in Ireland, born in 1769. And uh, he was educated in County Leash in a place called Port Arlington where there used to be an assembly there up to, I guess, the early 80s, maybe, uh, in Port Arlington. And he also then went to Trinity College in Dublin. And following his father's example, after getting his bachelor's degree, he went to London to study law and uh, at uh, uh, a school of law in uh, central London. Uh, he moved in very influential circles. Uh, he knew people, famous people of the day, Edmund Burke, a great philosopher, parliamentarian, lots of people like that. But how did this man get saved? Well, he was brought up in the Irish Episcopal Church, or what we call the Church of Ireland, but he had very little understanding of the gospel. As many people, sadly, growing up in denominational churches, um, and especially kind of the more ritualistic ones, you can grow up your whole life and know nothing of the gospel. And that was his case. Yeah. So his understanding was this. You have to struggle to please God by living an upright life. And the more he tried, the greater grew his sense of failure. And that's if you put yourself under a kind of a work system, ultimately, you're going to realize I'm failing. I'm not I'm not achieving what I'm I'm aiming for. And so it says that only when all hope of obtaining peace with God by his own merits had been stripped away from him, he discovered the path of forgiveness and acceptance lay in the work of Christ. The merits of the death of the Lord Jesus alone could save him and give him a standing before God. And he came to understand that, but he came to understand it in a most unusual way. While he was studying law, somehow he got old got hold of a Hebrew concordance of the Old Testament. And he began to be fascinated by this Hebrew concordance of the Old Testament. Can you imagine, I mean, how many testimonies have you ever heard of somebody who the first path to their salvation was reading a Hebrew concordance of the Old Testament? Well, he was reading and he was fascinated by it. And he realized that the guy who had updated this concordance uh, was a man called William Romain. William Romain was an evangelical Anglican preacher in England who had been greatly used in preaching the gospel. And so as a result of his interest in this concordance, he got hold of anything he could that had been written by William Romain. And in reading Romain's literature, he was, uh, this man could not speak without giving the gospel. So his literature was just infused with gospel and he heard it and he was gloriously saved. Uh, of course, Romain maybe is a subject for another one of our church history vignettes. He was a giant used in a place called St. Anne's in Blackfriars uh, in transforming London society by preaching the gospel. But anyway, so he he got gloriously saved and he, he went back to Dublin and he um, he was challenged uh, about the need of conversion by another evangelical leader called John Walker before he read Romaine's works and was saved, uh, the need of genuine inward conversion. We'll think more about John Walker later. But uh, he, instead of pursuing law, 
he decided to, to be ordained and to be a part of the Church of Ireland at 23 years of age. But having embraced the, the doctrines of the gospel, <clears throat> uh, his preaching would soon get him in trouble in his own denomination. And so what happened is he became a very popular preacher in Dublin. Uh, he was uh, in a place called St. Luke's Church in Dublin. And the congregations were flocking to hear a man who had a message that he really believed that gave hope and gave answers. And uh, however, it brought the ire of the establishment and his own rector in the church. Instead of rejoicing that the church was full, he stopped uh, him from preaching. He stopped Kelly from preaching. Later on, <clears throat> uh, he experienced an even deeper rejection than that of his own denomination, because in his enthusiasm, he went to talk to his own family about justification by faith. And his own family could not entertain the concept of forgiveness of sins apart from good works to earn God's favor. And so his family rejected him. He was a sensitive man. And he said it would have been easier to die a martyr's death at the stake than to experience the rejection of his own family. That's how we felt. He's a very sensitive soul. And um, he didn't flinch, though, from the cost. And he didn't waver in preaching his message. But it was very hurtful for him that the family that he loved just utterly, outrightly rejected his message. However, um, <clears throat> opportunities uh, he found to preach this liberating message that Christ receiveth sinful men opened up to him, and he began to preach. And uh, he, he, he had a great boldness. In fact, one, one of his hymns says, concerning the cross of Christ, it makes the coward spirit brave and nerves the feeble arm for fight. And he really felt that the Lord was strengthening him, empowering him to preach the gospel. And another uh, man, Roland Hill, who was maybe another subject for another uh, time, but uh, he came over from England where he was greatly used in Surrey Chapel in London to support uh, our friend, Mr. Kelly, in preaching. And they saw a great blessing together, laboring in the gospel uh, in Dublin. However, um, we said that this Anglican guy said that he, it was unfortunate the day in which he lived. And what he was getting at really was the Archbishop of Dublin at the time that Kelly was preaching was a man called Robert Fowler. And Robert Fowler hated evangelicals with a passion. He was a member of the Irish House of Lords. Uh, he had voted against removing um, discrimination against the nonconformists. So hard for us to understand this, but at that time, if you weren't a member of the Church of, of England or the Church of Ireland, as it was here in Ireland, you couldn't vote. Uh, you couldn't go to university. Uh, you couldn't work for the government because you were not part of the establishment. And so there were laws afoot. This was a time of great change. There were laws afoot to allow the nonconformists, men like the Methodists, the Congregationalists, to actually be able to participate in life in the country. And uh, this bishop was deadly opposed to it. And part of the reason was there was a kind of a, a, a doctrine at that time, which was kind of like the, the rule of kings, and that kings and bishops had the right to rule over the masses. And anything that even smelled of democ dem democracy or equal rights for others was considered to be a threat to the whole established order. The thinking of the day was the elites were born to rule and the rest were born to follow. Now, in our day, it's amazing how nothing really changes. <laughs> there are still the elites in our society who feel that they have the right to tell us how to live, what to eat, what to, you know, what to, what cars to drive, what to, you know, anyway, I'm not going to go there, but you, you get the idea. This elitism is not unique to his day, but it had a profound effect on society because the elites ruled uncontested and we're living in a day of ferment, ferment and change. So this man was a very political man, and he thought that evangelicals were a threat. So he 
and particularly Thomas Kelly, because of his preaching of the fact that everybody stood on the same ground at the foot of the cross. They all were sinners, whether they were bishops, whether they were kings, everybody was on the same ground at the cross. They all needed a savior. And he hated this idea that that even they needed forgiveness. They were kind of the uh, the, the elites. And so he literally closed every pulpit in Ireland to Thomas Kelly. So here he is. He's an ordained minister in the Church of Ireland, and nowhere is he allowed to preach. That happened as well to a man called John Wesley, if you remember, and a man called George Whitfield. They shut him out of the consecrated buildings, and that's why they ended up going to do field preaching. Well, it wasn't the case with Thomas Kelly because some things happened that really were a help to him. One of the things was that there was a uh, uh, a chapel in Dublin that was uh, connected with an orphanage, and it had never been licensed under the diocese. And so people there said, come and preach here. So he preached in, in this chapel, Bethesda Chapel in Dorset Street in Dublin, and again, reached multitudes. Many ordinary people came and heard a clear gospel and were wonderfully, wonderfully saved in this city center location right in the heart of Dublin. And so the Lord opened. He he's a God that sometimes allows doors to close on us, but he also opens doors. And in this case, a great and effectual door. Other things that really were helpful for Thomas Kelly was he married well. <laughs> he, he married a lady who uh, her name was Elizabeth Teague of Rosanna in the Ashford County Wicklow. And she was very wealthy. Her family had great wealth on both sides, her paternal and maternal side of the family. And so all of a sudden, this man who's rejected in his own, he's now got tons of money available for the furtherance of the gospel. And so what he did with that money was he built chapels in various parts of Ireland, one of them in Athai, uh, in County Leash, uh, others in Waterford, Wexford, Dublin, and he would circulate preaching in all of these locations. And so the Lord really uh, used him in a mighty way in reaching souls in these various locations. Interesting enough, because he's now kicked out of the Church of Ireland, is the pulpits are closed to him. He begins to look at church. How should church be done? How should it be carried out? What is the more biblical model? And he saw things like recognized elders, the need of plurality of oversight. He saw things like believer's baptism. He saw things like he actually believed in a back seat. He felt very strongly that there should be a clear distinction in remembering the Savior between the saved and the lost. <laughs> and so long before uh, the the assembly movement kind of came up with some of those, it was, in fact, the first time I came across Thomas Kelly was reading a book on the origins of the Brethren movement. And one of the things that it said was that Thomas Kelly's meetings had a profound influence on the early days of the Brethren movement. So here we kind of interesting, of course, and they sang many of his hymns. So um, one of the things about those days was there was a great extremism in the Calvinist camp. And he, he was a Calvinist. He was part of a group of Calvinists. And there was another group called the Walkerites. I mentioned John Walker. Very similar. Banned from the Church of England, started these independent churches, beginning to see New Testament principles. But there was a possibility of the Kellyites, which is what they were nicknamed, nicknamed, and the Walkerites merging together. And the story is told that negotiations finally broke down when the Kellyites refused to concede as an article of faith, which the Walkerites insisted upon, that John Wesley was in hell. Can you imagine that? Such was the extremity of the Calvinists that because uh, Mr. Wesley didn't believe in limited atonement, they believed that the man was in hell. In fact, B.W. Newton remembers being at a, in his uh, diaries, he talks about being at a, uh, a meal in Oxford where the whole topic of conversation was, where is John Wesley? And, and, uh, 
It shocked him. He was disgusted by it. But anyway, those are just kind of interesting church history asides. We think we have some strange things going on in our day. We're not unique. There's been some strange things in every generation. But anyway, going back to his ministry, now he's got these chapels, he's preaching. Uh, his rhetorical skills made him popular uh, amongst the common people. They could understand him. And uh, the, many people came out from the Church of, of Ireland, uh, left it and came in amongst his meetings. Also, many from the Roman Catholic Church also came. And as a result, these Roman Catholics got really upset, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, and they started a 20-year pamphlet war with Kelly. <laughs> and they basically were accusing him of poaching or converting Catholic parishioners into his, his evangelicalism. And his response, which is a very, very clever response, he says, I do not actively recruit anyone from the Catholic Church, but rather welcome them as they came seeking answers they were unable to get from their local priests. Thought that's a wise answer, isn't it? We're not trying to uh, cradle snatch or, or grab these people or anything like that. But people are coming to us because we have biblical answers to the questions they're asking. And so as a result of this, the work really began to prosper um, he never was reconciled with the Church of Ireland. And again, because he began to see through that the problem with the national church was it was a church that couldn't divorce politics from the gospel. And therefore, he felt it was a hindrance to the gospel. And so he would have nothing to do with that national church and its overemphasis on the political world. Well, we know him uh, primarily today as a hymn writer, and uh, he um, continued to write hymns over a long period of time, uh, 753 hymns in total. And in his last uh, issue of a uh, collection of his hymns, this is what he says in the introduction. It says, it will be perceived by those who read these hymns that though there's an interval between the first and the last of nearly 60 years, both speak of the same great truths and in the same way. Almost like he's defending the fact that I haven't changed a bit. In those 60 years, that gospel message of Christ redeeming sinful men is still my theme 60 years later. And of course, remember, he's living in a day where everything's changing. And yet one thing that's not changing is his hymns. They're, they still have the same message uh, that over a period of 60 years. He says, uh, in the course of that long period, the author has seen much and heard much. But nothing that he has seen or heard has made, made the least change in his mind that he is conscious of as to the grand truths of the gospel. <laughs> I love that. Nothing's changed. And so he said, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that was the theme of his hymns. And so uh, the Lord used this man in, uh, in a marvelous way. In terms of his character, um, this is what one person who was very close to him said, Thomas Kelly's life was marked by earnest prayerfulness. And one who knew him well said, of all the humble men, he seemed to be amongst the most humble. Now, that's quite a thing, isn't it? When somebody says that about you, it's a terrible thing if you dare to say it about yourself. But when somebody else says it, that's a really remarkable thing. And so for th 63 years, a well-known poet preached uh, the gospel and wrote these beautiful hymns. And one of the things that he wasn't afraid of death, but he did fear the process of dying kind of interesting distinction, isn't it? Not afraid of death. He knows where he's going. He knows whom he's believed. But he was a little bit concerned about dying because he didn't want to dishonor his Lord in the very act of dying. But God sustained him wonderfully. He, he suffered a stroke about a year before he died and never completely recovered from that stroke. And his faith never wavered. 
The closing moments of his life, of course, in man's last words are always are interesting. He declared, my great high priest supports me now. To which someone responded, the Lord is my shepherd. Kelly then quietly added, the Lord is my everything. His final words were, not mine will, but thine be done. The 86-year-old Kelly bowed his head and died. But we still have his magnificent hymns to remind us of the glorious gospel that he preached and the Savior that he loved and served faithfully with humility for all those years, despite rejection and opposition and all the rest of it. He just kept on keeping on till the very end. And what a challenge to us. Uh, you, uh, you say, what has this got to do with revival? Well, I would say this. Revival and hymnology always go hand in hand. If people who are excited about their message look to express it in every possible way, and the great hymnology that came out of this period was an expression of hearts that were aflame with love for Christ and his gospel. And so in a sense, they're, they're, they're a revival-born message that speaks even to our generation. So may the Lord encourage us with these short thoughts and the life of Thomas Kelly. And maybe next time you look in your hymn book at Thomas Kelly's hymns, you'll be able to remember at least a little bit about what you've heard about his life. Amen. Amen. Thanks, uh, Brother Mike. Yeah, thanks, Brother Mike. It was, uh, uh, we, I've heard of Thomas.